Honorary President, Chairman, my Lords, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Culford School and welcome to the 2016 annual meeting of the East Anglian Air Ambulance. It gives me great pleasure to introduce Major General Sir William Cubitt, new Chairman of the East Anglian Air Ambulance. Um, I'd like to add my own welcome to you all very much indeed for uh, coming to, I think, the second annual meeting um, here at Culford. Uh, it's a most impressive list of, attendant, of attendees today, and I'm really grateful to you for coming out on a Saturday in your very busy lives. Uh, and also more to thank you for your support in the various ways that you do that, either within the organisation or without it. Uh, where we really appreciate it, and we welcome this opportunity to give you an update on how we're getting on. Um, I took over as chairman in December. I've been a trustee only since September, so I'm very conscious that all of you have been involved with this charity longer than I have, which puts me in a bit of a spot uh, now. But nevertheless, there are a few observations that I'd like to start with. And the, the first one is that, in a way, it's only when you either need the air ambulance or you're part of the charity that you realise the extent to which the community and the public in our region absolutely takes for granted that there is an air ambulance service, a proficient air ambulance service in our four counties and indeed across the rest of the nation. Uh, it's taken for granted, but I don't mean that in a disparaging way, as, as one might if you said somebody's taken something for granted. It's because it's there and it's really testament to the achievement of those who have created it that it is now uh, a permanent feature of the emergency services, which is impressive. The second really impressive thing is that it's provided by the community. It's a prime example of the public providing something for itself that it really values. And that's really impressive and something that we should all be very <coughs> proud of. The third thing is that this has all come about in 15 years from a, a standing start, the vision of a few people, um, great energy and, and vision to get that going. And over 15 years, we have developed a really capable um, service. Now, what is that capability now? Well, first of all, it's two brand new state-of-the-art um, air ambulance-specific helicopters, the H145, uh, provided uh, by Bond Air Services on contract um, to us. And one of those H145s, the second one to come into service is outside, which you'll be able to look at later today. These are larger, they take more people, you don't have to have a medic doing a map reading, you have two pilots, they can fly at night, they, can, they provide more space for treating the patient in the back, uh, better stretcher and all that sort of thing. So it's, it's a real step change in capability. As I say, they come with two pilots, more expensive, more flexible, more capable. Uh, and also in the back, they come with a, an emergency medicine trained doctor often very senior, often consultant level, and a, a critical care paramedic, and equip, medical equipment that you don't get in normal ambulances. And what this adds up to is a medical capability on board our helicopters that is beyond that which any normal ambulance can provide, and indeed never will provide, because you, you just wouldn't be able to have that number of doctors in every wheeled ambulance on standby and so forth. So, it's a really important way of getting advanced medical capability to a patient. And when there, they can do things that other ambulances cannot. So they can put a patient under general anesthesia, uh, and they can do surgery to open the person up to find the source of internal bleeding, for example. These things are obviously absolutely crucial in certain circumstances. So... That, if you like, is the aviation and medicine capability. But as a charity, we've also um, matured greatly in terms of our structure, our professionalism, our management, and our, and our governance. Uh, we have a, a full set of expert directors. We have a chief executive who actually was one of the founder uh, trustees as well. Uh, and we have a, a set of trustees, eight looking for an, a ninth uh, trustees, uh, a new chairman, uh, all of whom are very committed uh, and spend a lot of time, obviously unpaid, to uh, make sure that this charity continues to deliver the highly effective service that it does. Uh, we also uh, have within our systems a, a sort of 
means of trying to make sure that we're permanently uh, achieving excellence. So we have a system called Datix, we may well he hear about this, which I've been really impressed uh, by seeing every month, is anything that goes slightly wrong, procedural, medical, security, safety, whatever it is, is put onto the system, properly reviewed, uh, properly investigated in a very open way, uh, and then uh, rectified and lessons learned from it. And I think that is absolute best practice, not only in a capability like this, but also in a charity where often they're accused of keeping things quiet and not, not being open and so forth. Um, and we've also, by good um, fundraising over the years, managed to build up a reserve. And again, many large charities come a cropper by not having sufficient reserve, uh, some very high profile recently. Uh, we've, we've built up a reserve that means that we've got 12 months uh, operating capability in reserve, enough money to run for a year if some mega disaster happens that cuts off our income streams. Uh, and so that makes us a mature and proficient and resilient charity. Now, to achieve that at this stage, I'd like to uh, just express my recognition to Andrew Edgerton Smith, who um, was the founder, my predecessor as chairman, supported by all the trustees and advisors who have been part of this journey uh, over the 15 years, uh, and indeed the, the management now and the staff. Uh, for achieving that level of capability, which really is remarkable. Uh, we've pushed him upstairs now, getting out of founder syndrome. He's now the honorary president, and delighted to see you here today. <coughs> um, we do about five missions a day across the two helicopters, um, mainly for road traffic accidents, heart attacks, and falls. Day and night with the new helicopter. Um, it costs about £4,000 a mission, and we've, last year we flew to 25 different hospitals. So it's not just a sort of county based you know, helicopter goes to your local hospital. It could be across uh, hospitals across the region and beyond according to need. Uh, and as I say, our princ the principal role really is getting advanced medical capability to the patient. And whether the patient is then subsequently transported to hospital by the helicopter is a different issue and really secondary to, to the first role. Um, this all costs a lot of money, of course. The, the capability itself, the, the blending of aviation, medical capability, oversight, training, medical equipment, knowledge, and all of that, that costs six and a half million with, with the new helicopters, six and a half million a year. And the overhead to do the headquarters function for that and the communications and marketing costs one million. So it's seven and a half million uh, to get, to run it, but it takes two and a half million to raise seven and a half on a return of investment of three to one, which is considered quite good. So actually that puts the bill going forward now to 10 million a year, which is obviously a very significant challenge for uh, fundraising. Um, but we've got a good record. Now, we've never had to get that amount of money before, uh, but we've got a good record over the years, which is evidenced by the fact that we've managed to build up a good reserve. So we have every confidence that we can do this, and we'll hear more about uh, the future and how we're going to do that um, as we go through the day. Now, I've explained the capability that we've got now and how, the, you know, how this compares to 15 years ago, uh, we've made some big changes now. And I, and I should mention in the capability that, that we've got two bases uh, as well. Uh, the Norwich one, uh, which we've now improved because we've got bigger crews in the helicopters, but the Cambridge one, where we've actually got a brand new one, uh, thanks very largely to the Marshall Group and to Michael Marshall in particular for the support on that. Brand new base, uh, state-of-the-art, custom-made for our, our air ambulance uh, service from the Cambridge base. So, in a way, there aren't any big steps that we currently need to make to get to that. But even if you were saying, well, we're going to stand still, it wouldn't feel like that, because you've obviously got to keep up to date with medical advances, to keep chipping away at you know, improving the patient outcome and so on uh, as opportunities arise. You've got ever more rigorous regulation, aviation, medical clinical governance, fundraising, charity commission getting fiercer, and all that sort of thing. That, even if you're standing still, all of that gets worse. Uh, and then, of course, you've got to raise £10 million a year. So even 
we're not standing still, but you know, even if you were trying to stand still, you would actually have to run very fast and it wouldn't feel like standing still at all. So we're, slightly, you know, we're entering a period of consolidation, but it's going to be very busy and very challenging just to do that. Uh, so what we plan to do over the next five years is to make incremental medical improvements as opportunities arise. Uh, you'll hear more about that from the medical director. We wish to try to reduce annual costs and we'll identify ways of investing to do that. And <coughs> we uh, wish to um, influence others to help with the process that we're part of. So, for example, um, we can chip minutes and seconds off our response time to get to a casualty. But it helps enormously if a first aider on the scene has already started CPR to keep that casualty alive, keep the blood pumping round. Uh, and so this year, for, no, last year, we, we ran some CPR training, and one of the things we wish to do is to spread that message. It's not just about the air ambulance, it's about everybody uh, helping a, a heart attack patient. Uh, and the second really important one is to do with helicopter landing sites at hospitals. Again, we can shave seconds and minutes, we can perform brilliantly medically on the ground and in the helicopter, but if you then arrive at a helicopter landing site that's hundreds of yards from the accident and emergency unit, uh, and then you either have to wait for an ambulance to turn up, or you've got a long trolley ride, it rather you know, disrupts the smoothness of this operation and isn't quite what we want. We, of course, don't own those helipads. He uh, hospitals all have a nightmare list of priorities that they have to invest in, uh, and so we're going to be looking for ways to try and get that improved uh, across the region, <coughs> across all the hospitals. They vary. Some are near and some are not. Um, so that's really what we're going to you know, look forward to, and you'll hear more about that from the Chief Executive later on. So really, in conclusion from me, once again, thank you very much uh, for coming today. Uh, you're going to hear from patients, the medical director, aviation director, the pilot, fundraising director, and the chief executive to either tell me that I've said the wrong thing, but hopefully to flesh it out. Uh, and then our latest new helicopter is outside. It's not actually on task yet, so it isn't fully kitted out with medical equipment, but it gives you a good flavour of the new helicopter. So now I'd like to introduce Tim Papworth, who...